Welcome to Westbrook Church Online. We are so excited that you are joining us here today. Everything we do here at Westbrook centers around the four markers of a healthy disciple, which are worship, connection, action, and practices. Next weekend, we will be celebrating Easter. And it's not just a time when we celebrate historical events, but for us, it's something much more than that. It's a time when we celebrate the hope that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is because of his resurrection. So we hope that you're able to join us. If you're able to join us in person, that would be fabulous. But we know that many of you can't. So join us online here at Westbrook and help us celebrate this uh, wonderful day where there are just a a number of people all around the world who will be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. On April 23rd, we have a wonderful opportunity coming up here at Westbrook, and that will be from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Oftentimes we ask, how can we serve tangibly and practically? And on April 23rd, we will have our meal packing project. All of the materials will be provided for you. All you have to do is come and help us pull some meals together that will be distributed around the world. And in order uh, for you to be able to participate, we ask that you do register online so that we can make sure we have everything set up for you. And you can do that by going to westbrook.church or going to our church center app. Today, Pastor Jake will be sharing a message with us about how to respond like Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, please open them up to Matthew 22 and be ready for a powerful message by Pastor Jake. Thank you. God bless you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Westbrook. Would you stand as we worship together today? It's so good to be together to sing songs and praise God together. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, and treasures that fail, I never know. When you came along and put me back together. Is now satisfied here in the love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. No. 
Good morning and welcome to Westbrook. My name is Jake. I'm the congregational pastor at Crossroads just down the road in Joliet. And it is my honor and privilege to be here with you this morning as we wrap up our sermon series called Like Jesus. This has been our Easter series leading us up to Easter because I mean, honestly, that's the whole reason that we celebrate Easter in the first place. We come to celebrate Jesus' death burial, and resurrection. And so we thought, leading up to Easter, what better topic to talk about than Jesus? Because as his followers, we want to be like him in every way, in the way that we pray, in the way that we love, in the way that we forgive. And today we're gonna talk about responding like Jesus. And that got me thinking, as I was listening to a podcast a couple weeks ago, I was listening to this podcast called Good Faith, and they were, they were talking all about identity, and I just found myself nodding along as they were talking, because I, I was just thinking, this is exactly what we're talking about in this series. Uh, one, one of the authors said, we become who we admire. And I thought, man, that is so true. How many of us that grew up in the 90s took pictures with our tongue out because we wanted to be like Mike, we wanted to be like Michael Jordan. Or, or a few years ago when dabbing became a thing, I, I just remember seeing kids walking around doing this. I'm like, what is happening? And now I have a bunch of nieces and they're into TikTok, so they're doing whatever TikTok dances are popular, right? We, we want to imitate the people that we idolize. The problem, the problem is that the people that we look up to, the people that we admire, are deeply flawed people. And so I think we need to ask ourselves pretty regularly, the, the people that we look up to, the people that we admire, who do they point to? Who are they pointing us to? Who are they teaching us to be more like? You see, the person that we're supposed to be like, the person that we wanna emulate, that person is Jesus. And here's the cool thing. This whole idea of us having this deep-seated desire to be like someone else, to follow someone else, this is a feature, not a flaw, because we were designed to be just like Jesus with our words, our actions, and our attitudes. Everything in us is supposed to point others back to God. And actually, that's exactly what we see Jesus do here in Matthew 22 again and again and again. No matter what's happening, even when people are coming at Jesus with animosity, he still responds gracefully and points them back to God. And that actually brings us to our big idea for this morning. And our big idea for today is this. Point others to God, no matter the circumstance. But what about, what about when you're going through life and you have friends, family, and coworkers who have different views than you or different opinions than you? What happens when you don't agree? Or what happens when they come at you with hostility? 
Well, my hope is that we would be like Jesus and we were, were, would respond gracefully and kind and even masterfully as he continually points others back towards Jesus. Now, I gotta tell you, there are gonna be times when you're talking to friends, family, and coworkers when they are hostile, when they're coming at you with mixed motives. But my hope and prayer is that us as Jesus followers would be like him. And even when people have the wrong intentions, we would still respond with love. We would still respond with kindness. And no matter what, we would point others back to God. Here's the problem with that. That requires us to be a little vulnerable. And when we are vulnerable with our friends, family, and coworkers, that opens us up to heartbreak. And I love what C.S. Lewis says about this very concept, this idea of opening ourselves up to our friends and family and and sometimes we can't have a perfect little Christian bubble around us. We, we can't insulate ourselves from the rest of the world. Because if we do, what we end up doing is cutting ourselves off completely. Look at what C.S. Lewis says when, when he's talking about this idea of being vulnerable with others. He says, to love at all is to be vulnerable. He says, love anything in your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. But... If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around little hobbies and luxuries. Avoid all, all entanglements. Lock it safe in a casket or in a coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless and airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, and irredeemable. The only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from the dangers of love is hell. I love what C.S. Lewis says about being vulnerable. If we're gonna be vulnerable and open, that means sometimes our heart will be broken. Our friends, our family, and our coworkers are gonna believe different things. They're gonna hold different values. But what I hope is that no matter what happens, the way that we live and the way that we love and the way we respond would give God honor and glory. So with that in mind, I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22 because in Matthew 22, what we're gonna see is Jesus responding to a couple different groups of, of leaders during this time. And really what's going on is like this three round sparring match between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day. Now, I don't know if any of you ever did any kind of martial arts or taekwondo or, or karate or anything like that when you were a kid or maybe with your kids, but when my brother and I were younger, we were in taekwondo and so we would do sparring matches in our living room all the time. And often they would turn into a little more than a sparring match. And, you know, our faces or nose or, or lamps would get broken. And of course, my mom would come yelling at us, right? But <clears throat> as I got older, I still loved the competitive aspect of a good sparring match. I got into college and I fell in love with battle rap, like you know, eight mile Eminem, that kind of thing where you have two grown men standing on stage uh, saying mean things to each other, but really they're friends and it's all kind of poetic. Uh, it's, it's a verbal sparring match. And then later on, after I got out of college, I, I fell in love with MMA and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I loved, I loved it because it's this back and forth competition. And with Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it's not about strength versus strength. It's about skill versus skill. I heard one person describe Brazilian in jiu jitsu as human chess at a hundred miles per hour. Here's why I bring all that up. When you're having a sparring match, the point of a sparring match is ultimately to make you better. And that's exactly what we see going on between Jesus and these religious leaders. First, we're going to see him interact with the, the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are legalistic fundamentalists. Another group that we're going to see him interact with is the Herodians. They're this Jewish group of people that were devoted to Herod. 
Uh, and the third and final group that we see is the Sadducees. They're the wealthy upper class, but the thing about them is they don't believe in the resurrection, and the only books of the Bible that they hold to be true are the Torah or the Pentateuch, the first five books of our Old Testament. And so these are the three groups of people that Jesus is having this three-round sparring match with, and what he's doing, at least the way I see it, is he's at each turn trying to make them better, and I think he wants the same for us. He wants to make us better. And the way that he does that is by pointing to God at every single turn. So with all that being said, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to start reading in verse 15. This is what it says. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians teacher, they said, we know that you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me a coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said, so give back, now that's really important, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. The first thing that I want us to see from this passage in Matthew 22, if you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. Jesus reminds us that we were made in God's image. Now, while these religious leaders are coming to Jesus with mixed motives and false intentions, Jesus sees through their intentions He sees through their hypocrisy and reminds them of the good news that you and I, that us as human beings were made in the image of God. See, they they felt like they were being attacked. When they looked at Jesus, what they saw was a threat. And so they planned this question in order to trap him. But why? Why do they want to trap him? Because they want to get rid of him. And and if they're going to get rid of him, they want to trap him in his words so they can arrest him and have him gone forever. But what Jesus does is he sees through their false flattery. As a matter of fact, he even calls them out on it. He says, you hypocrites. I mean, how many of us have been there? Uh, if you have kids or grandkids, or, or in my case, I have lots of nieces and nephews, and, and they come up to you and they, they start pouring it on. Oh, Uncle Jake, you know that you're my favorite, right? Or, or have you heard... Oh, mom and dad, you know I love you so much, right? And usually your question is, okay, what do you want, right? Because usually you know if if they're coming at you with false flattery, you know that they want something from you. And this is no exception. Jesus knows that they want something from him, that all of their words, their nice words, it's all false flattery. He calls them on He says, you hypocrites, The other reason that I know that their intentions aren't pure is because who we see teaming up. This is a very unlikely team up. This is like two enemy groups getting together because they have a common enemy. This would be like iPhone users and Android users finally coming together or Sox fans and Cubs fans or Bears fans and Packers fans. You you get what I'm saying, right? It's not impossible But it is pretty unlikely for the Pharisees and the Herodians to be teaming up. There must be something else going on. And Jesus sees right through it. They think they've trapped him. They think that they've put Jesus in check. I don't know if you play chess or not, but in chess, there's a move called check. Uh, Where if you get put in check, uh, it's because you've been attacked. You're king has been attacked, and this cannot be ignored. I think it's pretty important to remember that. But there's another move that actually ends the game, and that is called checkmate. If check can't be neutralized, 
And then it's checkmate and the game is over. Now what they think is they think they've put Jesus in check. They think that they've trapped him. But what Jesus does is he masterfully outmaneuvers them and puts them in checkmate and shows them that they're wrong. See, why are they asking about taxes in the first place? Well, you see, if Jesus says no, that they don't have to pay the tax, then he's going to be in trouble with the government. So the Herodians think they have him trapped. But if he says yes, what he's doing is acknowledging that Caesar is Lord. And for the Pharisees, this would be seen as idolatry. And then they would be able to trap him. They think they have Jesus in check. But when we see his response... What neither of them realize is that both of them are put into checkmate because he reminds them of something even better. He reminds them of the good news that they were made in God's image. And he does so by asking to see a coin. He says, can I see a coin that's used for paying the imperial tax? The imperial tax was one forced upon the people that were being controlled by the government. And any time a new ruler came, came into power, they would have new coins minted with their face and their phrase put on it. So Jesus asked to see the specific coin used for paying the imperial tax. And he said, whose picture is this? And whose image? I mean, it was quite literally Caesar's image and Caesar's inscription. So he says, well, if it's his, then give it back to him. But this is where I think it's really important. And this is the part that really encourages me because then I, I, I imagine he looks over at the Pharisees who knew the Bible very well, who would have been very familiar with the creation account where at the end of creation, at the end of each day of creation, he said, God said that the creation was good. And then on the final day when he made mankind, when he made us in his image, what did he say? He said that it was very good. We were made in God's image. When he was looking at them, he was reminding them of the good news that they were made in his image. They're trying to trap him but Jesus, Jesus is trying to remind them that there's something far more important than getting our way here on earth. He reminds them that they were made in God's image. Checkmate, game over Pharisees, game over Herodians, and they both leave with their tails tucked between their legs. Their foolproof plan was quickly derailed by Jesus. And I love what Dr. Mark Moore says about this. He says this, uneducated Galilean dismantles their question, exposes their motives, and convicts their hypocrisy all at once. He meets their malicious intent by pointing them back to God. And I think he wants us to do the same. When we're met with hostility, when we're met with animosity, it is our job to point people back to God no matter what. That's the first thing. Second thing I want us to see, if we're gonna respond like Jesus, is I want us to look at this passage in Matthew 22. We're gonna pick it up starting in verse 23. Jesus is questioned by the Sadducees. That same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then... At the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, you are in error because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you, this would have stung a little bit for them. Have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Is he not the God of the dead, but of the living? When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. 
and they leave. So the second thing that I want us to see from Matthew 22, if we're gonna respond like Jesus, Jesus reminds us that eternity with God is better than anything we could ever comprehend. Now I love, because this, this is encouraging to me, now, the Sadducees come at Jesus with a ridiculous question, an absurd question. But what I love about Jesus is he still points them back to God. He still points them to good news. Uh, and the reason I know that they have no real intention of knowing what Jesus thinks about this is because who it is that's asking the question. You see, the Sadducees... The Sadducees think they've set up this win-win scenario or win-win-win, as Michael Scott would say. They think they've set up this win-win scenario where they can shut up the Pharisees and get rid of Jesus because the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And why, you know, why are you making such a big deal about that? Well, look at the question. If you understand who's asking the question, you can see through their motives because you see that they have no actual they have no actual hope and desire to understand what Jesus thinks about this. They're only hoping to trap him. They're intentionally asking an absurd question. Now, I know exactly what this looks like because I did youth ministry for well over 10 years and I used to get all kinds of silly, ridiculous questions. And it was usually from the kids that knew, uh, that, that knew how to derail me because I got ADD and, and I'm easily derailed. And so uh, I would get all kinds of absurd questions and usually I could see when they were trying to derail me. But every Every now and then, they, they would get me, you know? Uh, but I would get all kinds of questions. I remember one time, I, we were teaching about baptism or something like that, and one of the students raises his hand, and he asked a question. He, he's like, well, now, what would happen if I was about to get baptized, and right before I got baptized, I got shot right through the heart, and my, I fell forward into the baptistry, my heart stopped beating, but I still fell in, I'm like, you are missing the point all together, this is exactly what's going on here. The people asking the question are intentionally asking an absurd question about the resurrection because they don't believe in the resurrection to begin with. And I love what Jesus does. Jesus points out just how small their thinking is by pointing out how big eternity is going to be. He reminds them that it's not gonna matter who married who? Because when we're in heaven with God, all of those relationships that help us so much now are, are, are gonna mean so little in comparison to being in God's presence for all eternity. I, I love what Mark Moore says in his commentary about this. He says, marriage is a great idea in our present world because it provides a, a resource for intimacy, procreation, and protection for the family. But in the resurrection, none of those things will be necessary in heaven we will have the capacity for intimacy with many people without jealousy or competition. You see, their view, their view of God, their view of heaven, and their view of afterlife is far too small and far too limited. So Jesus responds by pointing them to the good news that there's so much more to this life than they could ever comprehend. Eternity with God is far better than anything we could ever ask or imagine. He sees right through their question. He says, have you, have you not read? And th this would have stung a little bit. But then beyond that, he, he, goes, he goes on to quote Exodus chapter three. He reminds them that God is the, the father of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He is the God of the living. They think they put Jesus in check, but Jesus reminds them that he has put them in checkmate. They have nothing else to say. But they walk away knowing good news. that There's a God who loves them and who wants to spend all of eternity with them. Jesus answers their questions, avoids their traps, and points back to God. Now I want to look at one final section in Matthew 22. Uh, let's continue reading in verse 34. This is what it says. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God 
with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, after he sends the Pharisees packing, and after he sends the Sadducees and the Herodians packing, the Pharisees go back and they get an expert in the law. This is like the equivalent of a kid getting roughed up on the playground and saying, oh, wait until I go get my older brother. He's going to show you what's up, right? Uh, they go and get an expert in the law to come and test Jesus, and he asks them this question. This is basically like, pick a law, any law, right? And Jesus, Jesus goes all the way back to the very first passage that any Jewish boy or girl would have ever memorized, the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He, what he does is he reminds them of the most important thing, the fact that love is the law. If you don't remember anything else, you must remember that love is the law. We are called to love God with every part of who we are and then do our very best to love our neighbor as ourself. We remember what's important. Love God and love people. There are no loopholes. I, I remember... <laughs> People send me all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, one of the guys in our church sent me a little comic, book, comic, uh, comic strip the other day, and it was basically of this passage. Jesus is up uh, on the side of a mountain. I assume he's supposed to be preaching, and he says, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And, and then someone raises their hand. <laughs> uh, I imagine Jesus would be a pretty good youth minister, right? He, they raise their hand. And what about Gary? No one likes Gary. He says, yes, love Gary too. And then all of a sudden, Gary chimes in, ha, told you. Like, Gary, you're, you're making it harder on everyone else, but still, the point is true. God wants us to love everyone, period. There are no loopholes. If we're gonna respond like Jesus, then we need to, we need to remember that love is the law. We're called to love God with everything and love people. Love God, love people. That is the law. But here's the thing, proximity is not enough. I, I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, I, I was, uh, I'm, a, I'm a coffee drinker, uh, and my wife is a tea drinker, and I remember I was going to make a cup of coffee, and in our house we have our little uh, Keurig over here, and then we have a cabinet above our sink that has all our coffee mugs, and on that middle shelf, it's chaos, uh, it, it's just a, a, a hot mess of tea-related items. My wife, I mean, there's all kinds of boxes of tea. There's cans that have loose-leaf tea. There's little tea diffusers. She has like a, a little scuba man that, where they put the tank in. There's like a dog that hangs over the side. Uh, and, and I opened up the cabinet and like an avalanche of tea-related items comes forward on me. And as I'm putting them all back, I'm trying to figure out what's what and what they do. It hit me that this is the very thing that Jesus calls us to do. He calls us to interact with people because proximity is not enough. All that tea, the only way that it can make a difference is if you actually put it into the water. Whether you use a diffuser, you use one of those cute little puppy things, or whether you use a traditional tea bag, it doesn't make a difference until the tea and the water interact with each other. And this is exactly what Jesus wants for us. He wants us to interact with our friends, our family, our coworkers, and respond the way that he did, the way that he would, because proximity is not enough. We need to get close enough to people close enough to their mess to wade in and show them the love of Jesus. Show them what it looks like to love, forgive, pray, and respond just like Jesus. Now, the last thing I want to share with you is, is a story of a woman from our church. She, she, she asked if she could have a meeting with me because she was really discouraged because she had these friends that kept asking these really tough questions at work and they, they were having spiritual questions at, at lunch over, uh, over their lunch break and she's like, they have more questions than I know how to answer and I'm not sure what to say about this and what to say about that and I just told her, hey, 
If they're asking questions, you're heading in the right direction. That means that you're living out your faith and that you're a person that lets them know that you're safe for them to ask questions to. You don't need to have all the right answers. Just invite people to join you on your journey. Share what you know. If you've only been a Christian for a couple days, sometimes saying, hey, I don't know what's going on, but I know that Jesus loves me, and there's a place where I can go and I can hear about him, I can sing songs of praise, sometimes that is enough. Or if you've been following Jesus for many, many years and you know your Bible forward and backward, then maybe you should be walking alongside someone. Maybe you should be leading a rooted group. Maybe you can be more involved. The point is, no matter where you are in your journey, respond like Jesus and invite people along the journey. Easter is next Sunday. And Easter is a great opportunity to point others to Jesus, to respond like Jesus. You know that most people said that if they were just invited to church, they would accept that invitation. So I wanna challenge you to do. I wanna challenge you to invite someone to join you. If you're watching this online, I want you to share, share this video uh, on your Facebook feed. Or if you're watching on YouTube, I want you to share this link with some family and friends. Some family and friends that might need to hear the good news about Jesus. Invite them to join you this Easter. May you respond like Jesus at every turn. May you point others back to God no matter what. That is my hope and prayer for all of us today. Please pray with me. Father God, I wanna say thank you for another opportunity to open your word and to be reminded that we are called to respond like you no matter the circumstance. We love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we love you today. We thank you so much for Jesus. Yeah, we trust that you are speaking to us, that you are moving in our hearts and our minds and we thank you for that. Jesus
The church has historically used something called the divine mystery when referring to communion. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. In that short phrase, we have three tenses, past, present, and future. All three of these are tied together in the eyes of God, and communion is a time that proclaims that because of Christ's sacrifice, covered the past, present, and future. Christ's resurrection guarantees the past, present, and future. And the kingdom of God... Christ's return is here, but not yet. It's in the past, present, and will be completed in the future. Paul writes about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you announce the Lord's death until he comes. So the sacred act really is a sacred act that somehow connects us to God's time. When you partake, you announce, you proclaim. It isn't a time to sit and contemplate the sins of your life of this past week. It's a time to proclaim and to announce, to recognize that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. It is in that hope that we partake of communion. Let's pray. God, we recognize that... This is a time to proclaim that your kingdom has come. God, that it is here, but it is not yet. It is somehow your time works differently than our time, but God, that we know that we connect with you in this moment of communion, of proclaiming that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. We praise you. It is in your son's name. Amen.